Well, good evening and welcome to our evening service from Jones Lake Baptist Church. Trust you had a restful afternoon and so good to have you with us. Let's turn to number, if you have the blue books, number 55. If you don't have the blue books, well, I'm sure you, you at least know the first verse of when the roll is called up yonder. So we're going to sing... When the roll is called up yonder, I have three verses, so we'll sing all three verses of number 55 in the blue book, if you have it. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I trust each one of you can say amen to that and I trust you're looking forward to that time when we will be in glory with Christ and so it could happen any moment and so what an exciting thought that is well let's have a word of prayer as we begin our service tonight father we are thankful that we can be together although not uh, physically together, but it, that we can meet in spirit, Father. And we're thankful for the, the means that you've provided for us to uh, carry on the services here and that we have those that can join in from remote uh, locations, from their homes. And Father, that we can uh, just gather around your word and we can sing praises to you. We pray that you would bless this time tonight that you would meet with us in a special way tonight. Pray that the Holy Spirit would work in hearts and that we would uh, be prepared, our hearts would be prepared, that we would learn and have a desire to learn from your word, but also that we would have a desire to be better equipped to serve you. We just pray now for your blessing upon your servant as he brings your message tonight. Give him the words to say, the wisdom that he needs, and that we would uh, have a right attitude and just a desire to learn more about you and to serve you. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay. Well, we're going to sing, Shall We Gather at the River? And so we have, uh, it's number 64 in the blue hymnal. And... We'll sing uh, the first, the second, and the last verses, but it asks a question, and when we get down to the chorus, we have the answer, and I trust that's your answer tonight. Yes, we'll gather at the river. So, shall we gather at the river? 
verses 1, 2, and 4. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. On the bosom of the river, where the Savior King we own, we shall meet and sorrow never, meet the glory of the throne. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Soon we'll reach the shining river, soon our pilgrimage will see. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Okay, and then the next one we're going to sing. I don't even know if I know this one. <laughs> Just over in the glory land. I, I, think, I think we sang this recently, and I think it was uh, quite new to me at that time. So, Would you like me to lead that? Perhaps we'll bring... Pastor Hodder in, and he will lead it. And I'll learn it. How about that? All right, I do that to Pastor Pooley. He gets to do it to me. Sounds fair, amen? Have a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land and I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land just over in the glory land there with the mighty host i'll stand just over in the glory land i am on my way to those mansions fair just over in the glory land there to sing god's praise and his glory share just over in the glory land just over in the glory land i'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land just over in the glory land there with the mighty host i'll stand just over in the glory land. Let's sing that verse four there as our last on this one. With a blood washed throng, I will shout and sing. Just over in the glory land. Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King. Just over in the glory land. Just over. Just over in the glory land. 
We're getting better at it anyways. Maybe next time we'll be prepared to lead on that, but just over in the glory land. An exciting thought that is. Well, announcements. Uh, I guess uh, not a big change in what was uh, shared this morning, but uh, looking forward to our Wednesday uh, midweek prayer and Bible study. And so uh, that will be live from Jones Lake Baptist Church, but we're going to be watching it online, right? And so uh, don't just watch, participate, right? I'm sure your neighbors would love to hear your singing. So uh, sing along with us. And of course, make sure you have your Bibles and follow along your Bibles as well, right? But that's coming up Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock. And uh, we're just uh, praying that we're going to be soon moved into the yellow uh, phase. But uh, right now, as we're still under the orange, we're just going to keep planning on uh, online services. So next Sunday morning, 11 a.m. for our morning service. And uh, 6 o'clock p.m. for the evening service. And of course... Right now we're planning on that being online, okay? So uh, if things change, then we will keep you informed on what the plan is, okay? But uh, it's wonderful that we are still able to meet. And even though it's not uh, face-to-face, uh, we miss seeing each other. But uh, praise the Lord, we have this way of uh, having our services. Well, let's... Uh, sing one more hymn before the message and so we're going to sing the sweet by and by and so if you have the blue hymnal that's it's page number 41 and we'll sing the sweet by and by all three verses There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirits shall sorrow no more not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful father above we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Amen. Looking forward to that time. Pastor Hodder. Let's take our Bibles tonight, and 
we continue our look at the Holy Spirit as we have been uh, tied into our study here in the book of John, First, book of 1 John, I should say. you got to make that correct so you know where I'm at, that I'm in the right place, you're in the right place. 1 John chapter 4. Let's go back there again, verse 1. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we look at this passage, the challenge there, of course, that uh, John makes to his readers is to try the spirits. Check out the spirits, examine them, but not just a case of, you know, look at the spirits and say, okay, I like that spirit, and so therefore I'm going to believe it's the real spirit of God, and this one I don't because I'm not pleased with that message. No, we try it against the word of God itself. Everything uh, for the born-again believer ought to be measured against the word of God. We don't make decisions of understanding the scriptures, we don't make uh, decisions of understanding the Holy Spirit based upon how we feel and what makes us happy and what tickles our ears. No, we don't do that. We take God's uh, word for face value. That's what faith is all about, is taking God at his word. God has given us his word in the scriptures that we have before us. And so that's how we examine the, the spirits. We look to the word of God to understand what the Word of God tells us so that we might better identify who the Holy Spirit is. So our last few weeks, this is where we've kind of gone with our study, is studying a little bit, getting to know the Holy Spirit. And so I think Blake titled this week's, or at least put the title on the, on the uh, Facebook page there as uh, Getting to Know the Holy Spirit 3. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, we've talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, and he is a real person with intellect, emotion, and will. And we certainly see that when you study the Holy Spirit and the work that the Holy Spirit does. You see the Holy Spirit exercise those characteristics. And, we, and of course, it makes sense. If we believe that, God, that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, then he would have to exhibit those three things. If we deny that, then we deny the Holy Spirit as God, and of course, uh, then we deny God. We talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit was present at creation and actively involved in the ministry of the creating of this world and the creation of everything that we have. We know that the Holy Spirit, the Bible uh, talks about the Holy Spirit being involved, and again, it stands to reason. If God's involved, we know the Holy Spirit is involved because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they never work apart from each other. Each one has their own specific role, but they still function together. Now, how I'm not going to try to describe and explain that to you tonight, and probably never, because I don't fully comprehend uh, all that that entails, you know, who God is. We'll let God explain that maybe the other side of glory. You can ask him when you get there. Needless to say, the Holy Spirit is actively involved in creation. And then uh, <clears throat> last time we talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit is a source of divine revelation. We talked about the inspiration of Scripture. So I've been kind of giving you a lot of doctrine, not just related to the Holy Spirit himself. Oh, there I go, the Holy Spirit himself. But, of course, about other things related. But you, you kind of uh, have to 
have to fit it all in there to have a, a full understanding of the Holy Spirit. But we saw last time just the integral part that the Holy Spirit has in the work of the inspiration of Scripture, the work in, in the hearts and the, the hands and the minds of those individuals that wrote down God's holy word. And we know that the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us, as we saw last time, how the Holy Spirit worked in these men of old and used not only their ability to write, but they used, he used their intellect, he used their experience, their background, and everything about them to put together what we have here as the Word of God. And yet at the end of it, God had them not just by dictation, but God ensured what was written here. We can call the Word of God today, and we can trust that it is God's Word. Amen? And so that's, uh, that's where we're at as far as uh, Holy Spirit and divine revelation. Tonight, we are going to move at looking at the fact that the Holy Spirit is active in the world. The Holy Spirit continues to have an active role as part of the Godhead. He had an active role in the past, and he has an active role in the present. And so this is where we're taking our study tonight, and we're going to be looking at uh, two key things in respect to the fact that the Holy Spirit is still very active. The first one being this is that the uh, Holy Spirit was evident or is evident in his uh, in his activity in the Old Testament. We talk about uh, new believers, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, we talk about uh, as new, in belie uh, new believers being indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes to, <clears throat> at the moment, we trust Christ as our Savior. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us and, of course, begins to do a work in our hearts and a work in our life. And that comes out in what we refer to, or I should say what the Bible refers to as the fruit of the Spirit. But it's not just in present time. We understand that today as born-again believers, but yet in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did have uh, just an equally active role. The difference was, is in the Old Testament, that indwelling was not permanent. It was a temporary indwelling. So we certainly see, going from the Old Testament to the New Testament, uh, shifting to Christ coming to the earth, there is a significant shift in the role of the Holy Spirit, and, uh, but yet he was still equally active. There were individuals, uh, the prophets of old, in which the Holy Spirit had come upon them and used them and used other uh, different individuals, but each and every time he used them, it was a temporary indwelling. So God's plan and intention wasn't at that time that the Holy Spirit would permanently indwell individuals, and we're going to see it here as we take a look at it. Let's turn to Judges 15. Judges 15. The study through what we refer to as the historical books is a fascinating study as we as you examine the work of God with the nation of Israel and you see his, uh, Israel basically become a nation <clears throat> and so of course judges fits right into that uh, period of the historical books and it's at this point in time that we're introduced to uh, to uh, Samuel, we're introduced to uh, uh, different individuals that are used of God, uh, Samson being another one. And if you turn to uh, Judges chapter 15, Judges chapter 15, it tells us here in uh, verse 1, but it came to pass within a while after in the time of wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. 
And therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And Samson said concerning them now, Shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure? And Samson went and caught three hundred foxes, and took firebrands, and turned tail to tail, and put firebrand in the midst between the two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines, and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. And then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son, son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion, and the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them with hip and thigh and with great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock, Etam. And then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are ye come up against us? And they answered to, to uh, bind Simon, Are we come up to do him as he hath done to us? Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock, Etam, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that ye will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes upon uh, Samson here. It says that the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with the fire, and his brands and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. You know, Samson had this tremendous strength, this tremendous power. He was, he was certainly a strong man. You, you, you get this image of a fairly big and brawny individual, and you, you read about the escapades of Samson and the, and the different things that he did, and he certainly was a man of great strength. One of the things that Samson wasn't supposed to do was he wasn't supposed to cut his hair. And amazingly enough, even Samson himself believed that his power was in his hair, and yet we know the power wasn't in his hair, but the power was in God. And that power God bestowed upon Samson by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And just as we see here, as other times, the Spirit came upon Samson, and Samson had power even beyond his great strength. He certainly was a strong man, but it was the, the power of God, the strength of the Holy Spirit that allowed him to do the things that Samson was able to do. Later on, he will be, of course, his hair will be cut, he'll be taken into captivity, they'll poke out his eyes, and then they will mock him. And in his final hour, he will, he will bring basically the house down upon all those uh, that were there trying to mock and uh, make fun of Samson. And again, that strength came upon him because the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was able to bring down those pillars that would destroy them all. But again, we recognize that the Holy Spirit was the one that gave him the power. It was the Holy Spirit, the one that came upon him, but it was only a temporary indwelling. When Samson walked with the Lord, God gave him the Holy Spirit and used the Holy Spirit to do God's will. And, 
But when uh, Samson no longer walked with God, the Holy Spirit was no longer there giving, the, giving him the strength. We move on from Samson and we take a look at King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 11. 1 Samuel chapter 11, we read about King Saul, the people had cried out to Samuel and said, we want a king, we want to be like every other nation. Samuel had mourned over the fact that the people were rejecting Samuel's leadership as a judge. However, God points out to Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. The people were rejecting God. They wanted to be like every other nation. So God grants them their wish. In chapter 11 here, We read about Saul, and it says, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men, this is 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coast of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul, and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? <clears throat> and they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coast of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul... And after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. And they said unto the messengers that came, Thus shall ye say unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by that time the sun be hot, ye shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh. And they were glad to the men of Jabesh, and the, or showed it unto the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. And therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out unto you, and ye shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. And it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch and slew the Ammonites, the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered, so that two of them were not left together. And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. And then said Samuel to the people, Come, and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. And so Saul officially takes on his role as king of Israel. But you saw there in the passage that the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. And of course, the Holy Spirit will, uh, for the next while at least, comes upon Saul and will use Saul in the leadership of the nation of Israel. But the, the Holy Spirit won't stay there because Saul does not completely follow God. It won't be long before 
Saul takes upon himself some responsibility that he was not supposed to take. And as a result, God will remove the Holy Spirit. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'll let you read the passages in between on your own sometime, but you get that whole picture from Saul becoming uh, set up as king and then his leadership and then his fall from grace as far as his relationship with the Lord because Saul moves in haste, doesn't wait upon God, makes some decisions that, of course, creates a problem. But if we come to 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And so Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hear it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Look down at verse 10. We'll jump down to verse 10 here. And it says, Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now this is the anointing of David as king, the future king, not king yet. But it's uh, Samuel following through with God's command to anoint David, to prepare him. For that day when he would become king. Now, for the next period here, he will actually wind up in the the in the temple or in the uh, the palace of Saul, and would be the one that would be given the responsibility to soothe Saul because of uh, the evil spirit that comes upon him. But what I want to show you here in this passage is that. In verse uh, 13, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But look at verse 14, how sad it is for King Saul. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. What a sad day, and of course, that will haunt King Saul. It was his own doing. He had turned his heart against God, failed to obey. He sinned against God, and God removed the Holy Spirit. And that will drive King Saul crazy as this evil spirit comes upon him. But now we have the Holy Spirit now indwelling King David. But as we continue to look at this, we see that it was only a temporary indwelling. Let's take a look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, the psalmist points out the temporary nature of the Holy Spirit here. You notice in Psalm 51, this is a psalm considered a psalm of David. And in verse 9, he says, Hide thy face from my sins, blot out mine iniquities, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And look what David says here. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. 
You know, David recognized the temporary nature of the Holy Spirit, and he cries out and prays to God, Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Ezekiel 11. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 11. And in Ezekiel chapter 11, in verse 4, it says, Therefore prophesy against them, prophesy, O son of man, and the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. And again, we see how in this situation, the Holy Spirit comes upon Ezekiel. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was very, certainly very active, and not in, of course, just these individuals, but very much even beyond that. But the indwelling in the Holy, of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was very much a temporary indwelling. What's exciting for us today as born-again believers, that shift takes place. And the Holy Spirit moves from a role of temporary indwelling to where in this age, the church age, if you like, uh, the Holy Spirit will now move into a role of permanent indwelling in the born again believer, and that's uh, you know one of the uh, the joys that we have. One of the reasons why we can rejoice. Uh, Paul says, "Rejoice in the Lord always." And again, I say, rejoice. You notice Paul doesn't put any conditions on there. He doesn't say, "Okay, when things are good or when God has blessed you, rejoice," which we should. But he says, rejoice in the Lord always. How can we rejoice in the Lord? Doesn't mean we smile and uh, put on a, a, a false happiness. This, this is not about being happy. This is about having a joy-filled heart because we know the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's how we can rejoice. Is regardless of what we're going through, we have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Look at John chapter 14. Let's move on to the New Testament here. John chapter 14. And verse... Verse 16. The Lord Jesus Christ... Speaking to his disciples here, says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Jesus recognizing that his time with his disciples will be drawing short. And of course, Jesus will go to the grave and then ascend up into heaven. But it says here that uh, he'll pray the Father, that he'll give you another comforter, that he may do what? Abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, and ye shall live also. You know, Jesus is trying to encourage his disciples that, yeah, the day is coming when his ministry will be no more, his time on this earth will come to an end, and after that time, he's given them this wonderful promise that the Holy Spirit, this comforter he is referring to here, this paraclete, the one that would come alongside is what that Greek word basically describes, he will come. And this is a promise of Jesus Christ. It's a promise of God. So it's not just a case of, you know, uh, you can anticipate that this might happen. No, this was going to happen. And, of course, we know that once uh, Jesus ascends up into heaven, it's not too many days after that when you have the day of Pentecost, when in uh, 
quite a miraculous way the Holy Ghost makes his appearance. But the promise here is given of a comforter that will come. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We talk about the indwelling, permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but we don't always have those verses to confirm what the Scriptures say. And that's what I'm trying to do here as we look through the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 15. Actually, start in verse 13. He says, Meats for the belly and belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Kind of helps us see that uh, if we have this idea that, well, this is my body and I can just do what I want with it, that is so contrary to God's will and plan for us, especially as born-again believers. But he says, and, the Lord, and, and God hath both, ra- both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And he says, flee fornication. Every sin that man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? He says, know ye not that your body is, and this is important for us to understand as the born-again believers, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It makes us clear here in the scriptures what he's trying to say is that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. As a born-again believer, as a child of Christ, Our bodies are bought by his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And as a result, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. That's why he says there that the the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. You know, God has sent his Holy Spirit to indwell the hearts of the born-again believer. It ought to to cause us to seriously consider, you know, the different things that we become involved in as born-again believers. Because this this body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit indwelling us is just like God and and the Lord Jesus Christ indwelling us. Because remember, they, they are all one. But he has come to indwell us and to indwell us permanently. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 21, he says, Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the, what? The Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I come not as yet unto Corinth. And here he's, he's making it clear that God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, has anointed us and has sealed us. He's, God has put his stamp onto us. We understand this seal here is that idea of marking us as one of his, but it's not with a uh, visible birthmark, if you like, or a a visible mark on our skin that we can necessarily see, but it is with the earnest or the down payment of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee that by faith in Jesus Christ, we are one of his. 
And the mark of that seal that is upon us is the Holy Spirit. And guess what? Yeah, it's not a physical mark. You know, you're not going to be able to examine uh, a Christian's body and say, okay, yeah, there's, the, there's that stamp or the mark of the Holy Spirit. No, the stamp comes out in a different way. It comes out in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So guess what? You can see the mark. And I've seen it many times. I've run, individ- in, run into individuals that I did not know, but after watching their behavior and having a very short conversation, I come to realize, man, they're different. They talk differently, they react differently, and in the course of conversation, guess what? I find out they've trusted Christ as their Savior. That is the mark or the, the seal of God, the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of the born-again believer. And that seal is a permanent seal. The Holy Spirit indwells the heart of the born-again believer permanently. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. It says here in verse 10, verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 1, he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were what? Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. You see the order he even gives here. You know, you heard the message, you heard the gospel message, he says, you heard about Jesus Christ, you trusted in him, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. He says, after you heard that message, you believed in Jesus, you accepted him as your savior, And then he says, after that, he says, after the moment you accept him as your Savior, he says, the Holy Spirit came upon you. Jesus had promised it to his disciples. Jesus had promised it to us, the children of God. And he's given us the seal of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit who comes to indwell the heart of the believer. And you know what? I am grateful that that is a permanent indwelling. Because that guarantees I don't have to worry about my salvation. I don't have to wonder that if I make a mistake along the way and I sin against God, whether uh, deliberately or accidentally, that I'm going to lose my salvation. Because guess what? I've been bought by the blood of Christ and I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. and And the Holy Ghost doesn't leave this temple once he comes to indwell it. It ought to govern the way we live when we think about that. But at the same time, We're able to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, as Paul said, because the Holy Spirit's not going to leave us. Permanent indwelling. And I praise the Lord for that. Do you praise the Lord for the work of the Holy Spirit today? Yes, in the Old Testament, it was a temporary dwelling. Oh, the Holy Spirit was definitely very active. We only looked at a handful of examples but the Holy Spirit didn't permanently indwell individuals. But with the shift of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that changed. And what a rejoicing it is to know that we have that seal, we have that Holy Spirit, and he can guide us in all truth, and he can work in our hearts to direct us. We'll get into that next time as we examine the role and the work of the Holy Spirit what he actually does. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you have that permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit? That's the only way you can have him. I trust that you have this evening. And if not, don't hesitate to ask someone who knows the Lord is their Savior how, they might, how you might have that indwelling of the Holy Spirit because it changes your life. 
Father, we thank you for our time tonight. We thank you for this opportunity once again to examine the scriptures. We thank you for your word and the encouragement of knowing that, Lord, you've given us the Comforter, you've given us the Holy Spirit, and he has come to indwell and reside within the heart of every born-again believer. And so we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you'll help the Holy Spirit work in our lives, help us to be listening to the Holy Spirit, paying attention, heeding uh, the direction and work of the Holy Spirit so that we may glorify and honor you with our lives. Now, Father, I pray that as we finish up our service tonight, that you'll just go with us each and every day as we strive to serve you in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. All right, at this time, Pastor Pooley's going to come, and he's going to lead us in our closing hymn. Okay, well, we're going to sing The Comforter Has Come. And so if you have the blue book, it's number 349. We'll sing the first and the last verses. The Comforter Has Come. Spread the tidings round Wherever man is found Wherever human hearts And human woes abound Let every Christian tongue Proclaim the joyful sound The Comforter has come The Comforter has come the Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise give. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. Oh, boundless love divine, how shall this tongue of mine to wandering mortals tell the matchless grace divine that I, a child of hell, should in his image shine? The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise give. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. All right, well, praise the Lord. It's been great to be with you on this Lord's Day. Trust that you will join us Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock for our midweek prayer and Bible study. Have a good week.